Okay, it's good to see you here with us this morning again. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark and chapter 2, please. Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 12. And good hymn to transition into the sermon this morning, Jesus Says, because the title of our message this morning is Christ Has the Power to Forgive Sins. Christ Has the Power to Forgive Sins. We have before us an account of one of the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he heals a lame man. But we're going to find that his deity really was came under test in this passage, and Christ asserts his authority in verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Let's read from verse 1. Follow along quietly as I read uh, down to verse 12. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh to him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ documented for us. In the word of God. And Lord, we know that John, your apostle, wrote that it was impossible to record all of the things that you accomplished, that the world itself couldn't contain the books that should be written. But Lord, we thank you that by the Holy Spirit, you have included those miracles, Lord, that you would have us to know about at this time. And Father, particularly those miracles that speak to us of your person, that demonstrate your power and your authority and your deity. Lord, we pray that you would have your will and way in this message this morning, that you take this weak vessel, Lord, and fill, empty him of self and fill him with thy spirit, that, Lord, the, the message that we hear this morning would be truly from the mind of Christ uh, to each of us this morning, ministered to us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would minister to every need this morning. You know that within this one room there are many needs represented Lord, no doubt there are some that need to be saved, need to know Christ's healing touch upon their sin-sick hearts and lives. Lord, there are some, Father, that know you but need some sort of comfort or some sort of ministry this morning, some sort of challenge. And Lord, we can't, the preacher can't possibly know all those needs, but we come to thee, Lord, and we look to thee and to minister to every waiting heart, Lord, as only you can through the spoken word this morning. So help us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) You will notice as you read the Gospel of Mark that what becomes prominent now in chapter 2 and 3 is Christ's conflict with the religious leaders. And uh, they flocked to Christ on account of his popularity, but they were primarily there to challenge uh, his authority. They were there to try and undermine and dishonour his ministry. And this is one of the first major conflicts we find in Mark's Gospel here in chapter 2, where the religious leaders uh, criticise and oppose this miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you'll notice that in chapter 2 and 3, as we go through Christ having these contests with the religious leaders. And religion has never been a friend of the truth. 
And religion still is not a friend of the truth, nor is it really a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ in his, as he is presented in the word of God as the only saviour. Though much of religion may have a Christian label, they are still underneath opposed to the true teaching of Christ that he is the saviour and that there is salvation by no other means or no other person. Well, we have before us this account of the paralysed man who is healed by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is a powerful demonstration of the person of Christ and of his deity and of his authority to forgive sins. And the wonderful news for us this morning is that Christ still has the authority, he still has the power to forgive sin. And he is the only one who can forgive sin. And we are going to just see this morning what a wonderful illustration of salvation this passage is, as well as some challenges for us as believers along the way on bringing people to Christ. Okay, so let's look at our passage this morning. I want you to observe firstly, as we go through the outline here, verse 1 through 3, the context of the miracle. The context of the miracle is detailed for us in verse 1, 2 and 3. Let's notice a few things. We notice a multitude in verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noise that he was in the house. Okay, so the Lord Jesus had been absent from Capernaum for some time. We don't know exactly how long that was. We noted, didn't we, that ministry tour in the previous chapter of the, of the Lord Jesus, how he went about throughout all Galilee, preaching the gospel and healing those that were sick and casting out devils and so on. We notice the miracle of the leper as an example of one of the miracles that took place dur during that, um, that uh, ministry tour of the Lord. But after some time, the Lord returns and word spreads very quickly uh, by word of mouth and the Lord Jesus is very soon uh, surrounded by another multitude. We notice that this takes place in the house. Now we know from the previous chapter that this house was Peter's house uh, because there in verse uh, number... Um, 29 of chapter 1, it says, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon, okay, that's his original name, soon to be Peter, and Andrew with James and John. So would, we, we can assume uh, from chapter 2 that he's back in the house, uh, and in the context there of chapter 1, that would be Peter's house. All right, so that's interesting. Just bear that in mind when the roof gets broken up. Uh, there are sacrifices for serving the Lord and having the Lord in your home, so to speak. But what blessings came to Peter's house on account of him opening up his home as a base of operations for the Lord? Many were gathered together. This great crowd arrives. The house quickly fills to capacity uh, to the point where there are many more standing outside the door seeking to gain access. So we have the multitude in verse 1. Then we have the message in verse 2. The Lord Jesus, we find him seizing this opportunity. And in verse number 2 there it says, And he preached the word unto them. Again, Mark highlights for us, doesn't he, that Christ was preeminently and foremostly a preacher and a proclaimer of the truth. Before he was ever a healer, the Lord Jesus was a preacher. In fact, we find in the life of Christ, the emphasis was very much upon the truth first and healing second. Okay, important. We get that round the right way. So the Lord Jesus seizes this opportunity and there is a preaching service going on. Uh, Luke uses the word teaching to describe the same activity. So we can see the context there. The Lord is in a more intimate location in a home uh, with a large group of people, the crowd flowing out uh, to the outdoors there. And the Lord Jesus speaks in more of a conversational tone of voice, it would seem, as he preaches and teaches uh, the truth concerning himself, no doubt, the, uh, the word of God. And that's the greatest need that men have. It shows, doesn't it, from the life of Christ and his emphasis that the greatest need that men have is for the word of God, the word of the living God, the word that brings salvation and the hope of forgiveness of sins and uh, a place in heaven. But then we notice the man in verse 3. We're trying to just set the scene here, the context. We have a multitude. We have the Lord Jesus preaching a message. Then we have a man in verse 3 who is brought to the Lord. And the Bible says he was sick of the palsy. <coughs> now you say, what is the palsy? Well, it simply means he was a paralytic or he was paralyzed. And Webster's dictionary defines palsy as the loss or defect of the power of voluntary muscle, muscular motion in the whole body or in a particular part, paralysis. Okay, so very simply, 
This man was a lame man. He was a paralyzed man. And obviously his condition was fairly severe because he had to be carried by four men on his bed. And this man's lame condition really is a picture of the sinner before salvation. You see, before we come to Christ and before we know something of his work of forgiveness in our lives, like this man, we are completely helpless, hopeless and unable to save ourselves. And that's the first point you need to come to before you can ever come to experience the forgiveness of sins that Christ offers. You must understand that without Christ and before you come to Christ, you are absolutely unable to save yourself. Romans 5, 6 uses language here that, would, that brings out this whole picture of sin paralyzing us. It says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So here we have this man who is paralyzed. Obviously for him it is a physical condition, but it pictures for us the condition of every sinner that we are absolutely helpless and hopeless, unable to save ourselves. We see the four men here carrying this man could represent for us the ministry of soul winning. These men had no power to cure the lame man, but they could bring him to the one who could cure him. And that's the ministry that we have. We cannot save the sinner who is paralyzed by the disease called sin. We cannot cure them, but by God's grace, we can be a part of bringing them to Christ. What a wonderful ministry that is to bring sinners who are paralyzed by the disease called sin and introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ who has the authority and the power to forgive sin. That's a wonderful ministry. You say, well, isn't God sovereign and doesn't God just, you know, doesn't God just save his elect? Well, this passage very clearly reveals, as do other passages, that it's not a matter of one or the other, but rather God actually uses human instrumentality to bring sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some out there that believe that basically it's a hands-off scenario where we don't get involved with what God is doing and it's just God's work to save the sinner. Now, I agree in this respect that salvation is completely of God, that the plan of salvation is completely of God, but let's not... Uh, let's not forget that God has sovereignly planned as a part of his method of saving people to commit to us the ministry of reconciliation and that God uses men and women to lead others to him, to Christ. Do you remember the Ethiopian eunuch and he's, when he's in the chariot and he's, he's reading the scriptures? You say, well, just leave him alone. God will save him. Well, clearly he was going to get saved, but, you know, uh, Philip comes along, the, the Spirit of God sends Philip to a man who had the copy of the Word of God in front of him because this man needed help to get to the Lord Jesus. And Philip comes and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I accept some man should guide me? And so this is the method that God uses. We have no power to transform the sinner. We cannot change a life and we need to be conscious of that. But like these men, we can take every effort to bring the lame sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the ministry of soul winning is very clearly highlighted in this account as well. So we have the context for the miracle in verse 1 through 3. Then I want you to see the confidence for the miracle in verse 4 and 5. The tremendous confidence the faith that drove these men to the Saviour, to bring this man to the Saviour, and ultimately the faith of the man himself for salvation. The Bible says there in verse 4 and 5, And when they could not come nigh unto him, that's the Lord Jesus, for the press, press is another word for multitude, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw, notice this please, their faith. Can you see how God can use you to be instrumental in seeing somebody delivered? God saw their faith. God sees the weak attempts of the soul winner and God blesses those attempts of those who know Christ to bring others to him. Now their faith is not just the faith of the four men. It includes the faith of this man who is paralyzed. Obviously, if he was willing to go through all of the rigmarole of getting to Christ and being lowered down through the roof and all those things indicates that he himself also had faith in the Lord Jesus' power to heal. But the Lord Jesus used the faith of these men to bring this man to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice a few qualities about their faith. Notice the compassion of their faith the compassion of their faith. Uh, don't we get a clear sense that these men were driven by a spirit of compa compassion for this poor man? 
Certainly their faith involve compassion and and we need to have compassion too don't we for men and women who are paralyzed by sin second aspect of their faith we see the action of their faith can you see that their faith was an active thing when jesus saw their faith their faith in christ their confidence in christ drove them to make every effort to bring this man to the lord jesus christ to overcome the obstacles that stood in the way of this man coming to christ and by the way when you seek to lead people to christ there will be obstacles there will be barriers and our faith we need to have such a faith in the power of christ to transform lives it'll drive us to action and to persistence in this matter of bringing the lame sinner the helpless one to christ so we see the action, the action of their faith in overcoming these obstacles. So remember the scene, we have the multitude within the house, the crowd spilling out to outside the door there to the point where there was no way these men could access Christ through the door. So they did something very innovative. They went up onto the roof and uncovered the roof in that house. Poor Peter's house got damaged. But these men were determined to get this man to Christ. Now, understand, please, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a historical note here about the design of the houses in Bible times and even uh, the design of some houses in the Middle East even today. Okay, sometimes if you read this uh, from the Western mindset, say, wow, you know, you know, you think about one of our houses, how on earth would they get the tin off the roof and get down through the, uh, through the, um, the, you know, the noggings and everything and through the insulation? No, 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 the houses weren't like that, okay? They didn't have gabled houses um, with pitch roofs there in the Bible times. They had flat roofed houses, okay? All right, so uh, flat roofs and a common design um, in, uh, with biblical houses, and then they, so they uncovered the roof, the Bible says, and they broke it up. This, this idea of breaking up has the idea of to dig uh, up something or to dig through something. Now, Luke, in his account, in Luke 5.19, adds this uh, comment, they let him down through the tiling. Okay, now it's not one or the other. In, one, in Mark, we have them digging up the roof. And then <clears throat> Luke brings out this point that they, had, uh, they let him down through the tiling. Now, let me just read you a little description here of the ordinary house um, and its construction to help you understand the picture of what's going on here. <clears throat> and uh, it says this, the flat roof of an ordinary house would be constructed by laying beams about three feet apart from wall to wall. So you have the main beams, okay, laid uh, from wall to wall, roughly three feet apart. Short sticks were then laid closely together across the beams and covered with a thick matting of thorn bushes. Uh, at other times, as seems the case here, stone slabs or plates of burnt clay were laid across the beams. A coat of clay was then spread on top of this and rolled hard to keep out the rain. All right, so you have the timber beams, you have then the cross uh, members, the smaller pieces of wood, you have uh, a matting of, of a thorn bush, and then you have these, uh, these, these tiles placed on top of that, and then rolled hard on top of that again, this layer of clay or mortar. A coat of clay was spread on top of this and rolled hard to keep out the rain. They would, uh, the commentator says here, they would be readily able to dig out a hole large enough for the purpose without damaging the rest of the roof. Having cleared away the clay, they lifted the tiles to make the opening. Now, just think about what that would have been like for those underneath. I mean, there's the Lord Jesus. We know there's a preaching session going on. And maybe there's a little bit of a murmur or a stir outside and there's some sort of commotion, but these men uh, access the roof. The, the, the houses in that, in that day had um, flights of stairs usually at the side of the house to allow access to the roof. The roof was used kind of like we would use a porch today. You go up there to get some fresh air, even maybe camp out up the top there. All right, that's why in Proverbs it talks about a man dwelling in the corner of a housetop. Okay, it's better to be in the corner of a housetop than in a wide house with a brawling woman. Okay, she's a problem. Go up there, get some relief on the roof okay there you go men if you're having troubles with your wife just go up on the roof um and uh she'll call the the medical emergency services because you've lost your mind but um there we have it so the roof was used I mean, we don't have time to go through this but there's if you read the old testament it'll help you understand the design of the houses because the rooftop was used for many things remember david was upon the rooftop when he fell he saw bathsheba and then fell into sin Okay, so it was a place where you would maybe unwind and, and, uh, and, and, just, and so on. So these men accessed the roof from the stairs at the side, or possibly if the crowd was too great, from an adjacent roof climbing through that way. And uh, the whole purpose behind this is to bring this man to the Lord Jesus. You know, it requires effort. 
to bring a soul to the Lord Jesus. You say, I, I just find it so hard to get out of bed on a Saturday morning and come soul winning. I know, because it, it's labour. There is labour involved. I mean, this man no doubt was heavy and these four men uh, were, were lugging this man and carrying him for how, for how much distance we, uh, they had carried him, we do not know. But there was tremendous action involved to bring this man to the Lord Jesus. You know, Paul uses birthing language in his description of seeing a soul uh, set free and brought to the Lord. He says to the Galatians in Galatians 4.19, My little cho- children of whom I travail in birth again till Christ be formed in you. What, when was the first time, Paul, you travail? Well, I travailed, he says, spiritually to see them saved. To see them saved. I mean, any woman here understands if you've had a baby, uh, the, what's involved in travail and the labour pains and the, and the tremendous uh, effort and energy that is required uh, to bring that little life into the world. That's a picture of the believer and the, tra- the heart travail and the, uh, the travailing that has to take place in the place of prayer and the efforts and the labours and the loss of sleep that's required to see someone born again. Now, ultimately, the Lord's the one that does it, but he uses human instruments. That's you and that's me. And Paul's saying, I'm travailing in birth again. You're already saved, but I'm now travailing in birth again as your spiritual father in Christ here to see Christ formed in you. So there must be sacrifice to see souls saved. Prayer, time, labour, effort. So we see these men express their faith through works. And James talks about that, doesn't he? James 2.18, I will show thee my faith by my works. Genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will fruit in works. Okay, we know we're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. When you get saved, the good works will be the result of your salvation. So we see the compassion of these men's faith, driven by love for this man, love for the sinner. We see the action of their faith, their willingness to overcome the obstacles and to go to great lengths and great efforts just to get this man to Christ. That tells you something about their faith. They had complete confidence in Christ. They knew Christ could transform life. Listen, when that assurance really starts to sink in a bit deeper in our lives, we'll go to greater efforts to see souls saved. When we understand that Christ can still save, that Christ can still change lives, and when our hearts are filled with that sort of faith in Christ's power to transform the life, even in 21st century Australia, it'll drive you to do something. Good point, isn't it, when we're thinking about starting up soul winning again in a week or two? Effort, labour. Then we notice the attention of their faith. To whom was their faith directed? The Lord Jesus. The person of their faith. You see, true faith in the Bible is not a skyhook. It's not faith in faith. Sometimes people talk about my faith. How do you know you're Christian? Well, because my faith is growing. And it's like they've got faith in their own faith. No, no, true faith in the Bible is a faith that is directed to Christ. And these men uh, had Christ as the focus of their faith. Notice then the commendation of their faith. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. The Lord Jesus commends and praises these men for their faith. And the faith of these men played a part in seeing this helpless man brought to the Lord Jesus. And the Lord blessed it. Now the Lord blesses faith. Faith unlocks the hand, the power of God. Faith moves the omnipotent hand of God. And that's why when we pray for souls and when we pray for the working of God, we need to come in faith. And God loves to see us exercise faith in him. Oh, when we're honest today, if we're honest this morning, our faith is so often so weak. So weak. So the commendation of their faith. We notice the confidence for the miracle. Number three, the cleansing of the miracle that took place. The cleansing. Verse five again. Can you see the cleansing in verse five? When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Precious words, forgiveness. Interesting, isn't it? This man had a physical condition but the Lord Jesus Christ addressed his heart condition first. Can you see that? 
And it tells me that this man was coming to the Lord with a consciousness of his sin. This is what was weighing on his mind. You say, how do you know that? Because Matthew's account says that Jesus said to him, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven thee. Why would he say be of good cheer? Because here's this man who's troubled and burdened by his sin. You see, in those days, they very often connected physical illness uh, with sin. And it's possible, the account leaves this open, it's possible that this particular man was sick on account of sin. And there is such a thing. Uh, not all sickness comes from sin. We don't believe that. That's a, a Pentecostal charismatic teaching that's not accurate according to the Bible. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh that he had to deal with. But this man, for whatever reason, connected his physical condition to his sin. And the passage leaves it somewhat open there that that could be the case. But whatever the case, this man was clearly burdened by his sin as well as his physical condition. And the Lord Jesus Christ first deals with the disease of the heart before he deals with the disease of the body. Notice some things about this forgiveness, the release of forgiveness. Thy sins be forgiven thee. The release that comes from forgiveness. Do you know what the word forgiven means here? It means to send away. It means to pardon. It's the word used in Matthew 18, 27 of the forgiving of a debt. Isn't that a picture of how we come to Christ? We come to the Lord and we have this debt of sin and we are weighed down by the burden of sin and we have the guilt of sin in our lives. And when we receive forgiveness, the Lord Jesus discharges us of that debt. He clears the debt. Do you realize this morning that on account of sin, we owe the greatest debt to the Lord? I mean, we sin and we break God's commandments. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And on account of that sin, we have this tremendous debt before God. But when we come to Christ like this man did, and we are helpless and hopeless, but we cast ourselves in faith and dependence upon him, he releases us of that debt. That's what forgiveness means, to send away. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus sent your sin away when he forgave you? Aren't you glad that he erased the sin record from your life by the purging work of his precious blood? That's the cleansing that comes. That's the greatest miracle, by the way, that can ever take place before any physical healing. You know, there's a beautiful, uh, a wonderful little illustration of forgiveness in the Old Testament. In, uh, in Levit Leviticus chapter 16, on the Day of Atonement, and it brings out the twofold aspects, really, the two aspects of, of, of forgiveness and what forgiveness means. On the Day of Atonement, uh, two goats would be presented before the tabernacle, okay? And the first goat would be sacrificed, selected by Lot, as an offering, a blood offering, a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. And you can read about this in Leviticus 16. The second goat was then taken by a strong man out into the wilderness and set loose... And this goat was to bear the sins of the people upon his head. They would confess the sins of the people of Israel upon the head of the live goat. And then he would carry those sins symbolically there away into an uninhabited place in the wilderness. So here we see the, the two aspects of Christ's work on the cross for our sin. We see that Christ's blood was shed on the cross for the payment of, of sin. That's pictured in the first goat. Then we see the result of the blood of Christ being shed in the second goat there, namely sins taken away, sent away. Do you see that? And so the reason why God can send away your guilt, the reason why he can dismiss your debt, he can release you from the debt of your sin, is because the price has been paid. Do you realise that this morning, that the price of your sin was paid on a hill called Calvary, on an old rugged cross like we sang this morning, where Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was crucified there and he bled and he died for you. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he was saying to you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And he paid for your sin in his life's blood. And because his blood was shed, as pictured by that first goat, we see the second, the result of the shedding of the blood is that sin can be sent away. Aren't you glad this morning, if you've been saved and cleansed by Christ, you have been released from that sin debt? He's removed them from us, cast them into the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions for, from us. Aren't you glad he didn't say north to south? 
You can find the North Pole, you can find the South, but where does East start? Where does West start? In other words, the picture there is, is that God has so removed our sins from us, they cannot be found. They've been sent away. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom, referring to Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Staggering truth, even the forgiveness of sins. Psalm 133 through 4, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, who, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee. Do you know there's forgiveness with the Lord? There is forgiveness for that burden of guilt you're carrying this morning. Like this man, those many years ago, you say, I'm weighed down by guilt. You have no idea the sins I have committed. Listen, there is forgiveness with God. There is redemption with God. If you will come to him, let me ask you this morning, have you been released of your debt of sin? Well, I, I, I've been to the priest. Uh, uh, I've grown up in it. Uh, uh, I've been baptized. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I've spoken in tongues. No. No, that won't save you. You don't receive forgiveness of sins from the hands of a bachelor priest. The father, the father who dresses like his mother. You've heard that joke probably. You're supposed to laugh, but that's okay. I'm not good at telling jokes. We'll just get back to serious business, okay? What does the hymn say? Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Do you, how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress this morning or heard of it, the story? Um, no doubt some of you have. If you haven't, you need to uh, read it sometime. But what happens there at the start of the story? Well, Pilgrim is weighed down by this tremendous burden on his back. Do you remember what happened to that burden when he ascended there, the hill, and he saw the cross? The burden was lifted off him. And that's what can happen to you this morning. If you will come in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus like this man, you have no power to save yourself. You cannot uh, cleanse yourself you cannot heal yourself through any efforts on your own can't we see the picture here this man's lame he can do no works he can earn he cannot possibly attempt to earn his salvation but he could come in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness of sins and that's the same with all of us if you're trying to achieve salvation through your own works or looking in some manner to your upbringing in the fact you're raised in a Christian home or anything else but Christ it's insufficient you cannot save yourself this morning you must come to Christ and Christ alone for your forgiveness and the burden will come off so we notice the cleansing of the miracle the release of forgiveness the release of the debt the relationship that comes from forgiveness is another part of the cleansing here in the forgiveness process do you notice the word the lord jesus uses there he says son thy sins be forgiven thee you know there's a new relationship from forgiveness when we get saved when we get cleansed of our sins when the lord jesus christ does that work in our lives we become children of god do you know that until you experience salvation until you come to christ in this way in faith for healing and for cleansing you are not a child of god now you might be one of his creatures you could say that God is your creator, but you know, you can't really claim God as your father until you have repented of your sin and come to Christ in faith for forgiveness from those sins. Until that takes place, that process which is described by the Lord Jesus Christ in John 3 as the new birth, until you are born again into the family of God, you, you are not yet his child. But when I get forgiven, when I come like this man in faith to Christ, helped along by the prayers and the hands of others, no doubt, as they seek to bring me to Jesus Christ, I become his child's son. Thy sins be forgiven thee. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Can you think of a greater privilege than being called the son, a son of God? a daughter of the king the bible says in john 1 12 but as many as received him that's the lord jesus christ to them gave he power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name have you received the lord jesus christ this morning because when you receive christ he gives you the power to become the sons of god the child of god
the cleansing of the miracle, release, the release of forgiveness, the relationship from forgiveness. Then there's rejoicing from forgiveness. You say, how do you know that? Well, Matthew's account in Matthew 9, 2 includes these words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus says, son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Is there any greater joy than knowing that sin is forgiven? You're not sure about that? Oh, help us. I said, is there any greater joy this morning than the joy of knowing that you have been released from the weight of your sin? If you've lost that joy, you better ask the Lord to renew it this morning. I said, if you're saved this morning, according to the word of God, you have been released from the debt of sin. That means that your sins will never be brought up in, before the throne of God. That means you'll never stand in judgment before God. And we say, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Isn't it a blessing as a believer to be able to lay your head on the pillow at night and know that sins are cleansed, sins are forgiven and eternity is secured. Be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. The cleansing of the miracle. Fourthly, the criticism of the miracle. The criticism of the miracle. Amazing, isn't it, how much opposition can come to one who's been transformed and opposition always comes from the religious crowd. Those who outwardly maintain a show of religion, but inwardly, as Jesus exposed, are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Verse 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. <laughs> Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? Now, their, re their logic was correct in this respect, that only God could forgive sin. The Pharisees believed that. The Pharisees believed only God could forgive sin. Correct on that point. But they were wrong on this point that they assumed that Christ was not the incarnate word, the incarnate God, God manifest in the flesh. You see, they assumed that Jesus Christ was not God. By the way, if you diminish Jesus Christ to anything other than God, you no longer have forgiveness of sins, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, or moron, I mean Mormon, Mormon. By the way, you can't diminish him. Christ will, he'll never change who he is. All you end up with is a false Christ who cannot save. The criticism of the miracle. We note the scribes' reasoning in verse 6 through 7. Luke tells us that the Pharisees and doctors of the law were present from every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, Luke 5, 17. So there was quite a delegation there of religious leaders, the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, the experts so-called of religion present. Amazing, isn't it, how cold-hearted the religious leaders can be towards a man who's just been transformed and changed. So the scribes believed that Christ, that only God could forgive sins. Their logic was sound on that point. They believed that Christ blasphemed by claiming the prerogative of deity. On that, they were definitely wrong. Why? Because Christ is God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. Not he was manifest in the flesh, modern versions. God was manifest in the flesh. And because he is God manifest in the flesh, that's why he could assert his authority in verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. The fact that Jesus Christ can forgive sins testifies to us that he is God of very gods. He is God manifest in the flesh. So we have the scribes reasoning. Then we have the Saviour's rebuttal in verse 8 through 9. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason you these things in your hearts? Now, we see another attribute of deity exercised by Christ here, his omniscience. Can you, imagine sitting, can you imagine sitting down with another brother and thinking a particular thought in your mind and, they, and then you, that other brother answered that exact thought that you had in your mind? And that's not going to happen. Okay, because you're not Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ answers not the, not the spoken words of these men. He answers the attitudes and the thoughts of their hearts. You know, the Lord Jesus can see past the exterior of every one of us here this morning. And he knows the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. 
He knows what sort of questions are running through your mind. He knows what sort of thoughts, perhaps, of resistance to the word of God are running through your mind. We need to remember sometimes, I think, when we come to church, that the, there is someone who's actually present here with us, according to Revelation, walking amidst his church <laughs> with his all-seeing eyes, piercing into the depths of your soul. And here the Lord Jesus Christ immediately recognised a wall of resistance, the spirit of resistance that suddenly filled the room from these religious leaders, though they had, they had spoken nothing. Jesus knew their thoughts, Matthew tells us, Matthew 9, 4, and declares that their thoughts were evil. Evil thoughts. It's evil to entertain thoughts that are wrong about God. <laughs> it is evil to entertain thoughts that are contrary to the truth. You know, just by way of application here, we need to consider, don't we, the attitudes and the thoughts that we harbour towards the preaching of the word of God lest they have an effect on the atmosphere of the house of God. The, the, I'll, be, I'll not say anything. That's all right. These men didn't say anything either, but the Lord Jesus immediately sensed this hostile spirit. May I say sometimes as the preacher, when it gets down to declaring the word of God, sometimes you can feel a wave of hostility. It's not here this morning, I don't think. I'm just saying. You don't have to say a single word. But whatever attitudes and thoughts you are harbouring as the truth is being declared from the word of God, provided it's accurate according to the word of God, that's the word of the Lord Jesus, affects the spirit of the service. Come on, we've all had times in our lives where we've, the word of God stung us in a particular part in our lives and we've resisted. Maybe that's for you this morning, I don't know. And in verse 9, the Lord Jesus outlines a simple test that whether he was to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise and walk, essentially amounted to the same thing because you had to have the divine authority to do that. Their religious leaders believed sickness was a result of sin, so in order for Christ to be able to heal this man, would it would simply... Uh, reaffirm and demonstrate the same truth that he had the power to forgive sins because they believed the order was you had to first forgive the sin and then heal, uh, then the person could be healed and only God could do those two things. So they're basically saying, well, Lord, you're saying you can forgive sins, but I mean, we can't see any evidence of that. That's an internal thing, the forgiveness of sins, but the Lord Jesus makes it clear that if he was, that, that the uh, healing this man then physically would be the visible um, demonstration and would authenticate his uh, right to forgive the sin. As one commentator says in verse 9, Christ states the test as a challenge to his critics. Jesus implied that neither is to be said without authority to do so. The scribes might insist that his claimed right to forgive sins was easier to declare since it was an inner matter which could not be verified by outward ob observation. But his authority to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk, could at once be validated by the visible test of success or failure. So in other words, if this man failed to rise from his bed, that would raise suspicion over Christ's claim to forgive sins. But the Lord Jesus now says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He's saying this to the religious leaders. In order that you can know that I have the power to forgive sins, I'm now turning to this man and saying, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. So for the Lord Jesus Christ, the miracle of healing now in this lame man was to be a visible uh, authentication of his claim to forgive sins. He says, listen, I have the power to forgive sins. I have the authority to forgive sins. And now I'm going to demonstrate that by the healing of this man. And he turns this man and says, arise, take up thy bed and walk. Save his rebuttal. So there's the criticism of the miracle. And opposition will come to you when you get saved. Opposition will come from those who may be claimed to be religious. Why are you going to that church down there? It's a cult. Um, any number of things. Fifthly and lastly, I want you to see now the completion of the miracle. So the Lord Jesus completes the miracle now. Firstly, he addressed the disease of the heart. He forgives this man and saves him. And then he completes the miracle now with the physical healing. 
I say unto thee, verse 11, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. We have the Lord's claim in verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. That was his claim. Interesting, the Lord refers to himself here as the Son of Man. This was one of his favourite titles. You'll find it reoccurring around 15 times uh, in Mark's Gospel in total. And uh, this title, if you go back to the Old Testament, we'll actually cover this in our Daniel series in due course, is found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14 where Daniel sees the vision of the Son of Man, and it's particularly in relation to his glorious return. And so the Lord Jesus takes this Old Testament title of the Son of Man from the book of Daniel and applies it to himself. And as you study his use of this title, it particularly seems to be connected with two, two main themes. Firstly, his suffering and death. He employs the term Son of Man in relation to his suffering and death. For example, Mark 8, 31 Mark 9, 9 through 13, chapter 10, verse 33, I could give you other references. And then he employs the term in connection with his future, his future return in glory, Mark 8, 38, Mark 13, 26, Mark 14, 62, and so on. But you know, this is a precious title, isn't it? The Son of Man, as it reveals our Saviour's connection to the human race. We see, don't we, in, the, in, the, in these two titles, Son of God, Son of Man, the the two natures of our Lord, Son of God, that's his divinity, Son of Man, his humanity. And the Lord Jesus loved to use the title Son of Man. And he says, I have the power to forgive sins. The word empower, power implies two things. It implies authority and it implies ability. Okay, when Jesus said, I have the power to forgive sins, that speaks to us of his authority. It's his divine right. It's his a prerogative to forgive sins and the word power also brings out the aspect of ability that Jesus both has the right and he has the ability he has the power he has the strength to save the sinner and he still has that power this morning I said he still has that power this morning and that power is available for you the Lord Jesus Christ still has the power because we don't serve this morning a dead Christ who is still in the tomb somewhere there in Palestine. We serve a living Saviour, a living Christ, an all-powerful Christ, an all-knowing Christ. And because Jesus Christ is alive today, he still has the power from heaven to forgive you of your sin and set you free. And let me say this morning, would you come in faith this morning that Jesus Christ can save me? Oh, would you be saved this morning? What would hold you back? I mean, what would hold you back as someone paralysed by sin from coming to Jesus Christ who can set you free? He has the power. Do you believe that? Do you believe he has the power? He has the power to forgive sins. It's his right. He has the authority by virtue of his position. He has the ability. Both those aspects come out of the word power. So we see the Lord's claim, verse 10. Then the Lord's command in verse 11, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. Think about this for a moment. That was an impossible command. This man, to this point, he's had his sins forgiven. The Lord's dealt with that. This man still lies there lame. But this is something that takes place in the miracle of conversion, that the word of Christ itself imparts the power to obey. As the Lord Jesus issued the command, in that command was the power for that man to respond and to do that which is impossible, to arise and walk. So the Lord gives this man a threefold command. Get up. Christ is in the business of lifting people up, isn't he? <laughs> Came, took her by the hand, verse chapter 1, and lifted her up. You see, that's the picture, isn't it, of us as sinners. We are, we are, we are very low we're helpless, we're hopeless, we're down in the gutter of sin, but the Lord Jesus is in the business of lifting us out of sin and out of the old life and out of the paralysis of living in this world. He lifts us up. Get up. Pack up. Take up thy bed. 
go home, go thy way into thine house. You know, that's the pattern, isn't it? When the Lord sets us free, when he transforms us, he says, now it's time to go home and to be a witness. It's time to, ta- it's time to go home as a new person, as a transform, transformed person. And, and, and God's way is not to isolate us in some sort of cave somewhere, but to send us back out as transformed people into our homes and into our families and into our workplaces, to go out to be a witness for him. You see, this man did not go out the same way he came in, did he? This man came in a lame person, he went out walking. This man came in helpless, he came out transformed. This man went in a sinner, he came out cleansed. You see, you can't come into living contact with Christ and go away the same again. You will never be the same again when you come into living contact with Christ. Away with this idea today that somehow you can just, uh, that, that salvation means that you just, that you stay the same and just sort of add Jesus to your life. That's not salvation. When I came into contact with Christ, something changed in my life. I didn't change me, but he changed me. You don't go out the same way you came in. The Lord's command. And we have the man's compliance in verse 12. He obeys perfectly and fully the Lord's instruction. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Of course you'd never see it on this fashion. (laughs) Religion has no power. The religious systems of the world have no genuine power. The religious leaders of Christ's day had no power. They were phonies, they were fakes. But these people came into contact with something real. Listen, we're not talking this morning about another form of religion. We're talking about something real. Obedience, the power of his obedience. I've mentioned before that the word of Christ imparted the power for him to do the impossible. And that's essentially the way we get saved through supernatural power. And then we walk out into the Christian life and we must walk by supernatural power. And it's the word of Christ that imparts the power to us. We notice the perfection of his obedience. He obeyed all three of those commands implicitly. You see, salvation should result in a life of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the flow on of salvation. We see the people's response to his obedience. They were amazed and glorified God. Then we notice his own praise as he was obedient because Luke's gospel brings out this also that he departed to his own house glorifying God. Mark says the people glorified God, they're amazed. Luke says, ah, it wasn't just the people. This man walked away, he was glorifying God. Do you glorify God for the day you met Christ? Do you praise him? Praise him, praise him. This is our blessed redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. Hello? You can't... I know we have our ups and downs, but, but when you... You think about what Christ accomplished in your life. You can't but help have praise well up in your heart. You can't help but sing. You can't help. Listen, you were on your road to hell. Now you're on your way to heaven. You were lost. Now you're found. You were a sinner. Now you're saved. Listen, how can that not affect you? Completion of the miracle. You see, the work that the Lord Jesus does is a complete work. It's a full work, a total work. What God does, he does forever. That men may fear before him. And so Christ has the power to forgive sins. He's all God, all man. And he can still save. Let's bow for prayer. Two challenges this morning.